Hello and welcome! I am uh, Washusan, and this is the first episode of my new series called Nuclear War Simulator. So I found this simulation on Steam and I think it's really, really interesting. First of all, Nuclear War Simulator is definitely not a game, but an actual simulation of the effects of a nuclear war, especially on the population and on the civilian infrastructure. So I thought it would be interesting to make a few videos featuring some scenarios that it offers. But before diving into an actual scenario, I thought it would be a good idea to try to understand the simulation just a little bit better. So I'll be looking at the models that Nuclear War Simulator uses, and I'll compare the results to other models like the ones used by NukeMap, which by the way is a web-based uh, nuclear weapons effect simulator. I want to give special attention to the Fallout models, since it turns out Fallout is very, very difficult to model, and it actually is very, very important for the casualty calculation, as I'll illustrate now. So in order to illustrate this, let's take a look at a couple of single detonations near, but not really on top of a very densely populated region. So to start with, I'll go to settings and I'll turn, out, turn off Fallout radiation. That means that no one is going to die due to fallout. I'll apply that. And here we are. This is uh, Brazil. I'll turn on the nice map. This is uh, Rio de Janeiro. And here is uh, Angra dos Reis. Uh, there is actually a nuclear power, power plant here. And so I'll use uh, the default explosion or the default warhead and uh, detonate it right on top of Angra dos Reis, which is very far from Rio, actually. So here we go, I'll speed this up. We see that the cloud is going over Rio. And now I can uh, calculate the casualties. So uh, you can see that only 106,000 people died. That is because fallout was disabled. So only people that were affected by the physical explosion uh, died. So as you can see here, so only people that were uh, next to the physical effects of the bomb. So let's go back. I'll reset this. And now let's turn on fallout radiation. And go back and detonate the same bomb exactly on the same spot and see what happens. So it was about here. Let's speed this up. So now I have the cloud going towards Rio again, but now there will be many, many ca casualties at Rio. Remember that we had about 100,000 people died just around the explosion. But now one can see by uh, the casualty map here, that many, many people died in uh, Rio, de, Rio de Janeiro. So you see that uh, before we had 100,000 people die and now we have 1.1 million people die. So this is to illustrate how important fallout is and how deadly it is. When I turn on uh, the fallout dose map, this is uh, what you can see. So we have uh, quite high doses at a very, very long distance from the explosion. And uh, this map is quite symmetric, as you can see. And uh, there is a large region uh, in Rio where you have quite a high dose. That's what kills uh, all those people. So now let's uh, change the Fallout uh, model. There are actually two that work. Uh, we have the default one, which is really fast, and we have this high split one, which is actually a dispersion model for the radioactive particles, or any particle for that matter. And uh, it's much, much more heavy, uh, but uh, for single uh, explosions, we can use it. So let's take a look, apply this, and uh, do the exact same detonation that we did before and see what happens. So the same default warhead. We can see that the cloud goes in the same direction as expected. And now let's calculate this. So it will take some time. 
and here we have it. We can see that uh, it's not uh, very symmetrical like, like the other one was, so this takes an, into account like turbulence and uh, differences in wind direction as uh, it propagates, etc. So it's much more detailed. But one can see that uh, the effects uh, on the fatalities is very, very different. So before, without fallout, we had 100,000 people die. With uh, the default model of Fallout, we had 1.1 million people die, and with a uh, uh, high split, we have 276,000 people die. So, again, this is to illustrate how important uh, Fallout is for casualty calculation. Here's a comparison between the two Fallout maps, high split on top and the default WSCG-10 at the bottom. You can see they're very different. High Split has the high dose region concentrated closer to the explosion, and it also drifts a little bit towards the south, leading to just a small high dose area over Rio. On the other hand, the default WSEG-10 model predicts a much larger area with high doses overall, and also over Rio. This much larger high dose area over Rio is what accounts for the much larger number of casualties predicted by the default model. Let's take a look at another single explosion, this time in the Netherlands. Uh, here we have a large air base that's bound to be attacked if something happens. And uh, I've also added some poor guy that will be outside Groesbeek, uh, 20 kilometers exactly downwind from ground zero. The explosion parameters are the same except that I decrease the wind speeds slightly to 9.6 kilometers per hour which is 6 miles per hour. So let's take a look at the fallout from this explosion. One thing to note is that the fallout map in a nuclear war simulator is in terms of the total expected dose in Grotkens. It is not the dose rate in Grotkens per hour or rads per hour. This will be important when we compare the results of this explosion with a nuke map. So now let's uh, uh, speed up time and check when exactly uh, the fallout arrives at uh, Hruzbeek. 30 minutes, 40 minutes, there you go. About one hour uh, after the detonation, we have a peak dose rate of 848 uh, Rotkins per hour at uh, our uh, poor guy's uh, position. So now let's uh, go on and um, see what's the total dose that uh, he will receive uh, within the first 48 hours of the explosion. And there we go. We have a total dose of 2,035 uh, Rotkins. Uh, for the first uh, 48 hours uh, after the explosion. I'll now change a few parameters. I'll change the model to high split. And I'll also change an option here uh, that instead of uh, plotting in terms of the total integrated dose, it will uh, plot a dose rate, H plus one dose rate, which uh, for our purposes uh, would be similar to the peak uh, dose rate that we get uh, in our position. So let's apply that and explode a bomb in exactly the same place. Now we can calculate it. So uh, you can see that uh, we don't even uh, reach uh, the uh, peak of uh, 2000, uh, which is the other scale. So here is 500 and uh, here is 100 and uh, we should be about 400 or so here. So this is a more apples to apples comparison uh, that I'll do with a uh, nuke map. Before comparing these results with a uh, nuke map, Let's take a look at the effect uh, the burst altitude has on the calculated fallout. So here I changed uh, the settings back to the default WSEG-10 model. So let's take a look at a couple of explosions at different altitudes. We'll start with uh, the same burst, but at uh, 795 uh, meters. 
and I'll do another explosion here and change the height to zero meters. So that's now it's a surface burst. And let's now calculate uh, the fallout. As one can see here, uh, they are pretty much the same. Actually, they are the same. So if we look at uh, the WSEG documentation, uh, one can see that it uh, assumes a surface burst. So there is no change uh, in uh, the fallout if one changes uh, the uh, burst altitude. What about high split? This is what I got for a 500 meter burst that is changing now to what I got for a surface burst. And you can see they are indistinguishable. So high split also does not take into account the height of the burst uh, in the fallout. So this is a nuke map uh, where I used the same burst parameters I used in nuclear war simulator, except that I set nuke map to simulate a ground burst, since now we know that a WSEG assumes a ground burst at zero meters, provided of course the fireball reaches the ground. I also used a sample point at the exact same uh, position of the poor guy we included in nuclear war simulator. This is the result that we will compare to WSEG later on. So NukeMap uses a different fallout model developed by Carl Miller in the 60s, which is based on data from uh, American atmospheric nuclear testing. It is called Simplified Fallout Scaling System or SFSS for short. It is in some aspects very similar to WSEG-10, as I believe they are both scaling models. But there are also some key differences. For example, uh, unlike WSEG-10, the Miller model takes into account the stem of the mushroom cloud. This uh, leads to two different regions uh, of fallout with different characteristics, as can be seen here. So the overall shape of the, the fallout looks like uh, the shadow the, uh, the wind would make uh, on the mushroom cloud. So here you have the contribution of the stem and here you have the upper part of the cloud. So it turns out that the WSEG model does not take the stem of the cloud into account as the Miller model does. Another difference between the models is that the Miller model includes a correction factor for the height of the burst, changing the amount of soil available for fallout. So, unlike WSEG, there is a dependence of the fallout on the altitude of the explosion. Let's take a look at the effect burst altitude has on the calculated fallout by the Miller model. So, here we have a surface burst, and now I'll change that to air burst and change the altitude. So, let's go to uh, 50 meters, for example. And you see that uh, the uh, fallout area diminishes. So let's change this altitude again. Let's go to 250 meters. You see the area gets smaller and smaller. And finally, let's go to 500 meters, which is the value that I used uh, in a nuclear war simulator. And there you can see that we have a much, much smaller area where uh, there is a significant uh, fallout. So, why does the intensity of fallout depend on the burst altitude? First, there are two types of fallout. Local or early fallout, which is the one uh, we've been discussing so far. And it is uh, deposited in the region downwind from ground zero, typically within the first 24 hours after the detonation. The second type is the delayed or global fallout, which is deposited many days or even years after the explosion. The radioactivity in the fallout mostly comes from radionuclides produced during the nuclear fission process. These nuclei have excess nuclear energy and are unstable. They emit this excess energy in the form of gamma rays and or particles, a process called radioactive decay. The speed with which they emit energy, on average, can be roughly described by its half-life which is the time it takes for half of the original nuclides to undergo radioactive decay. The half-life of the radionuclides producing a nuclear explosion vary from fractions of a second to millions of years, but the short-lived nuclides are the most dangerous in the short term, 
since they emit a lot of radiation in a very short time. But that also means that their radioactive emission won't last very long. In the case of a true airburst, where the fireball never reaches the ground, only the vaporized bomb material will get into contact with the radionuclides inside the cloud. These particles are very small and light and will climb along with the cloud to very high altitudes, where they will disperse and stay airborne for months or years. So, airbursts don't produce a local fallout. Also, since most of the produced radionuclides are short-lived, most of the radiation will be emitted at high altitude, far away from everything. Of course, the more long-lived nuclides will eventually fall to the ground, creating a global fallout. Although they are less radioactive than their short-lived counterparts, some are very hazardous biologically, such as strontium-90 or cesium-137. On the other hand, if the fireball touches the ground or is very close to it, it will vaporize a large amount of material, such as earth, dust or water. On top of that, this material will be made radioactive by the massive neutron flux produced by the explosion. This material will be sucked up due to the updraft generated by the rising mushroom cloud, where they will also be mixed with the radionuclides. As the cloud rises and cools, this material will condense into large and heavy particles that also promote the condensation of the radionuclides on their surface. These heavy particles then fall out quickly from the cloud, producing a local fallout. Since the short-lived nuclides are still active, these particles are extremely radioactive and can lead to a potentially lethal dose of radiation in just a few minutes. So, how do the fallout models differentiate between what's an airburst and what's a surface burst? I found two expressions for what's called a fallout safe height of burst, which is a height of burst uh, where the fireball is sufficiently far from the ground not to produce significant local fallout. If we take the first expression and plug in the 800 kiloton warhead we've been using, we get 795 meters. Let's go back to Nuclear War Simulator. Here I have the same warhead as before, but now at 795 meters. Let's detonate it on top of the airfield again. Now let's increase uh, these uh, burst heights to 796 meters, just one meter above, and detonate uh, this bomb nearby. So now we can calculate the fallout. And if we show the fallout map, one can see that uh, at 795 meters, we have the big fallout. And at uh, 796 meters, just a meter above, we have no fallout at all. So it seems that uh, Nuclear War Simulator is using uh, that expression that I just showed you. This seems like a very harsh threshold, especially because uh, WSEG does not scale the fallout as you increase the burst height. So you go from uh, the huge fallout you get at zero meters to nothing just by changing the uh, burst height by one meter. Let's go back to nuke map. Uh, now I'll set the same 800 uh, kiloton warhead and do the same thing we did uh, in nuclear war simulator. So let's set uh, the detonation height is 795 meters and we can see uh, fallout and uh, now let's change that height by 1 meter to 796 and uh, detonate it again and you can see that uh, the limit or the threshold is exactly the same as it is in Nuclear War Simulator which is that first expression that I showed you what else does the fallout depend on? Well, one would expect uh, it would depend on the yield of the explosion. So let's check it out in Nuclear War Simulator. Here I have a 2 megaton uh, warhead. I'll change that to 1 megaton. Now 500 kiloton. 
and finally 250 kiloton. Let's calculate the fallout. So one can see that the area covered by fallout diminishes as I diminish the yield of the explosion. I found this plot that relates the area covered by a certain dose to a yield. One can see that for the dose I chose, if I double the yield from 500 kilotons to 1 megaton, the area increases only by around 60%. If I compare with a yield of 5 megatons, 10 times bigger, the area roughly increases only by a factor of 6. What about NukeMap? Here you have a 2 megaton explosion, a 1 megaton explosion, so it gets smaller, a 500 kiloton explosion, and finally a 250 kiloton explosion, which is the smallest of them all. So here you can see the four put together and see how uh, smaller it gets as I diminish the yield. Finally, how does the fallout area depend on the fission fraction of the weapon? Fission fraction is just the ratio between the yield due to fission over the total yield of the weapon. Most modern large yield weapons, above 100 kilotons, are combined fission-fusion explosives with approximately equal amounts of fusion and fission, which is, they have a fission fraction of 50%. These are thermonuclear weapons that combine a nuclear fission primary stage that is used to create the temperatures and pressures necessary to ignite a nuclear fusion secondary stage containing thermonuclear fuel, usually composed of deuterium and tritium or lithium deuteride. I have already told you that most of the fallout radiation comes from the radionuclides produced during the fission process. In contrast, if we disregard neutron activation, no radionuclides with significant half-life will be produced during fusion. That means that at 100% fission fraction, we will have the full radionuclide production, while at 50% fission fraction, only half of the radionuclides will be produced. That means that at 50% fission fraction, only half of the radiation will be available for fallout. Another important factor is that the dynamics of fallout particle dispersion does not depend on the fission fraction, which is, if we only change the fission fraction, all fallout particles will land at exactly the same positions. What will change is how radioactive these particles are. The contours of the fallout map will not change by changing the fission fraction. What will change is the scale of the dose that the contours represent. To obtain the fallout map for a burst with fission fraction F, all we need to do is take the doses that were calculated for the 100% fission fraction case and scale them by a factor of F to take into account that the fallout particles are 1 over F less radioactive. Of course, if we plot both fallout maps in the same color scale, the footprint of the lower fission fraction will be smaller. But the scaling still holds. In this example from Nuclear War Simulator, the area covered by the 400 Rodigan exposure at 50% fission fraction will be exactly the same as the area covered by the 800 Rodigan exposure at 100% fission fraction, and so on. What about nuke map? Here I show two fallout maps, 100% fission fraction at the top and 50% at the bottom. In this plot, I use the same color scale for both maps. For that reason, the fallout map for the 50% fission fraction is smaller. Now, I'll change the scale of the bottom map to show half of the doses of the upper map, just like I did before. Now, one can see that the fallout areas are exactly the same just like in the nuclear war simulator example. So it seems that NukeMap also scales the fallout map doses with the expected number of nuclides produced by the burst, which is the fission fraction. In NukeMap, the fallout is described in terms of H plus 1 dose rate in reds per hour. To illustrate what it means, I put a probe where the dose rate is 100 reds per hour with a fallout arrival time of 1 hour. Let's see what NukeMaps shows us about the probe. 
H plus 1 dose rate is a normalization commonly used by scaling models that shows the dose due to fallout as if it arrived just one hour after the explosion everywhere. But, due to the decay, the real dose rate has to take into account the actual arrival time, so, for longer arrival times, the real dose rate will be lower. Since the arrival time at our probe is one hour, the H plus 1 dose rate and the actual dose rate are one and the same. This is the result we got from Nuclear War Simulator using high split in H plus 1 dose rate in Rutgens per hour. And this is the result of Nuke Map in Reds per hour. Note that not only the unit is different, but the scale is also not the same. So I changed the Nuke Map scale in Reds per hour to match the scale in Rutgens per hour we got from Nuclear War Simulator. Rutgens and Reds actually measure different things. Rutgen is a unit of exposure, which you can think of as the amount of radiation around you. Red is a unit of absorbed dose, which is the amount of radiation actually absorbed by your body. But for practical purposes, Rutgens and Reds can be considered equivalent. Let's finally compare the high split results from Nuclear War Simulator with the SFSS results from NukeMap. Remember that I couldn't find a way to plot WICG10 results in H plus 1 dose, so we can only compare the high split and SFSS maps to very different models. This is what we got from SFSS. Now I'll slowly superimpose the results from high split with the same scale. The SFSS map is much wider and slightly shorter than the high split one. The areas covered by the 500 Rotogen per hour dose rate are similar, but start at larger distances in SFSS. The total areas covered by the 100 Rotogen per hour dose rate are also similar, but much more stretched in high split. All in all, the results are in the same ballpark. For example, the dose rates at Enschede are very similar for both models, and even at Hruzbeek, where our probe is, they are not too dissimilar. Now let's compare the results we obtained for the position of the poor guy we included in Nuclear War Simulator. The first line are the original results I got for SFSS, while on the second line I slightly revised the position of the explosion to match what I used in Nuclear War Simulator more closely. The third line are the results from WSEG-10. As I mentioned, we couldn't compare its map with SFSS because it calculates only the total dose. Finally, the last line are the results from high split in H plus 1 dose rate mode. Although Nuclear War Simulator claims this mode shouldn't be used to calculate the effects on the population, the results were pretty similar to WSEG. The fallout arrival time calculated by both models in Nuclear War Simulator are about half as long as uh, what SFSS predicted. The H plus 1 dose rates of high split and SFSS with the corrected bomb position, are also pretty similar. But the peak doses and total doses are very different. I believe this could be, at least in part, because of the differences in arrival time. Since the arrival time of SFSS is much longer than one hour, the H plus one dose rate should be significantly bigger than the actual peak dose rate. And we see that. Also, since the arrival time for high split is around one hour, the peak dose rate should be very close to the H plus one rate, but the peak for high split is almost twice that value. Maybe that's uh, what the warning about using high split in H plus one dose mode uh, was about. The total doses refers to the first 48 hours after the explosion. The large discrepancy we see between the total doses from the nuclear war simulator models and the SFSS model could also, at least in part, be attributed to the large difference in arrival times. Another explanation would be different decay rates between the models. If the dose rate diminishes faster in nuke map than in nuclear war simulator, that could account for the difference in the total dose. But I didn't investigate that. So, what do I think of the fallout models in Nuclear War Simulator? Well, I think the default WSEG-10 model is serviceable for what a Nuclear War Simulator is. 
although I would have liked to see the inclusion of the dependence of fallout with burst height. Maybe with the implementation of a similar correction factor for the amount of ground material available for fallout as a function of burst height, like the one used by the Miller model. Since Nuclear War Simulator treats all bursts below the fallout safe height as bursts at ground level, this could possibly lead to an overestimation of the fallout and casualties. The high split dispersion model, although computationally expensive, is impressive. The maps produced with it are, I think, much more detailed and realistic. But it suffers from the same problem as WSEG10. I believe the particles used as input for high split do not change with burst height, so the fallout doesn't change either. I didn't look into the other models, such as thermal and prompt radiation, overpressure, etc. I believe modeling these are much more straightforward if compared to fallout. On the other hand, the different scalings with the yield for each of these effects is very interesting. So, in any case, I could uh, look into that if there is any interest. So let me know in the comments if you would like to see an episode about that. I learned a lot during the making of this video. I think now I understand a little bit more about how the Fallout models work. And so do you. If you liked the video, please press the like button. Also, I included links to some of the material I used in the description. Check them out. Finally, let me stress that I'm no expert in any of this. So, if you know better, let me know if I made a mistake, didn't understand something or misrepresented something. Or, if you have questions, just let me know in the comments. For the next episodes, I will return to my initial plan. Just show some of the many scenarios that Nuclear War Simulator offers. If you'd like to see those, consider subscribing to my channel. Now, let's just hope we'll never be able to compare the results of these models with new real data from nuclear explosions. Thank you very much for your attention and until the next episode!